enter and be closest to the divine world. Uh, so this is actually a tourist map of the holy mountain itself, uh, where they tell you the narrative of all these little little stories that somehow create this pilgrimage up and to create the significance of the temple of the Jade Emperor, which is at the top. So there's the immortal bridge, there's the thousand foot falls, there's the black dragon pool. So as you go up, you are somehow going through the layers of the layers of reason why the emperor is the most important guy in the country. That's one way to reach the divinity by by going up towards a high space or to create a high space, but also uh, in Hindu visualizations, uh, the deities themselves come down to earth and touch the earth itself and make it and make it into a semi-divine uh, space. So, for example, this is a, a miniature painting from 1755 showing Vishnu and Lakshmi coming down to earth and uh, creating this palace uh, on earth itself. And most of the miniatures from this period were actually painted by, uh, by, by Muslim painters. So that is quite interesting too. And also uh, another way, uh, and because of this uh, divinity coming down to earth itself, uh, you created spots of divine spaces, uh, these small divine spaces. So this for example is in Braj, also in India. Uh, where there's the Yamuna River, this long line that, that cuts across this map. But also because there are stories of the divine, like Lord, Lord Krishna came down and did something here or did something there. Uh, so every story will have a temple and slowly with time it creates a kind of a pilgrimage route around this, uh, around this wheel and around this river, so it creates a kind of a, a, narrative, of, a, a narrative of holiness. So this whole area becomes quite an important site for pilgrimage, uh, yeah, for various religions. Uh, uh, so for me this is quite interesting to somehow create a sort of a paradise or sort of a divine spaces based on small, small divine spaces. I think from there we'll talk about creation. Uh, yeah. This to create something because that is the yearning for to meet a divine being, or you are just interested in to, in the puzzle of the location where exactly it is as a scientific person or as an explorer, and but also to create something again so you can see what was lost before. Uh, this is uh, in Islamic geometry. It all starts with zero, or at least when mathematically z zero becomes important in in Islamic culture, the visualizations of what is the divine uh, derived from the mathematical is, uh, a zero. So basically, just the absolute, and the absolute spreads itself around, and then that is the circle of it. And with this first logic, we get all these patterns of infinity, where you know, like these repeated patterns that goes on and that seems to go on and on and on, which shows the absoluteness of the divine. Also, the logic of mathematics in uh, in the in in the Protestant church in the in the cloister van der Lan, in the Dutch German border. Uh, Van der Lan himself, he is a priest, but also he was trained as an architect. So he followed absolutely the, the golden triangle uh, to create this space where every, every ratio is a divine ratio. So when I went there, I, or when I read about it, it seems uh, very, almost like a prison uh, because of the strictness of him using the ratio from the space itself to the benches, to the floor tiles, to the pillars, to how the sun comes in even. So, but when I was there, it feels quite nice actually. So, so that was quite a, quite a funny thing. Yeah. And also, 
how the brothers in the cloister uh, uh, pray or what they do is also based on the golden triangle. So it's a very mathematical way to find the divine. This is uh, a Hindu visualization of the emergence of the spirit and matter. Usually in Hinduism, Brahman is never really visualized because he's the absolute one God uh, or the main, the main uh, deity. But here, I think this is one of the rare few times where there is a proposal to show what uh, exactly this is. And this was again drawn by the Muslim emperor the, uh, in, 18, in 1828. So you, you kind of get the absolute again and then the emergence of, of the line around the absolute and then it creates this space which is not yet earth but it's becoming earth itself. So if you look at this and you compare back to the Islamic zero, I find a lot of similarities of that gesture, that first gesture of what uh, the, the divine space is. Uh, when the Europeans uh, started exploring more towards the tropics, uh, there is the issue of the maps, how do we create maps, uh, and also as scientific knowledge and how and the precision of navigation becomes much more precise. Uh, then there's the issue of where exactly is paradise because uh, most of this exploration is funded by the church and you need a reason for it. So they explore stuff for you know, like to find resources, but they have to find as well paradise because the church gives a lot of money. So there's this problem when the latitude and the, long, and the longitude was uh, was used to map out uh, the world. There is the issue where paradise is, and paradise in this map, one of the first few maps, is at zero zero. So it's somewhere maybe in the Philippines or yeah, it's on the equator. So maybe we are quite close. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely not Singapore. Close. <laughs> yeah. So how? So you know like. When, when they put it on a map, they have to find it, you know, like, because you put it on, on a map, the, your finances will insist that you have to go and find it. So how they solve the problem of not finding it is by creating a narrative where paradise is now something which, which was gone. So, it's, so uh, from this, we know that uh, where paradise is, it's, it's a heaven. Uh, it's an earthly space, it's not a heavenly space. So, so now it was something from the past, from, from after, uh, before the flood, paradise is somewhere in this world, but after the great flood, it's now sunk and you know, like we can't find it anymore. So there is this narrative where, where there's the four main rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Nile, I think, and I forgot the other one, uh, yeah, where if you follow the four great rivers and you will reach a single source and that's where the earthly paradise is. Uh, yeah. And again here you see Adam and Eve. So this is the world we live in and this is what was before, uh, which was gone. But you can trace it back if you follow the four rivers. That was in uh, 1450. But in 1905, uh, Someone calculated that this lost world is somewhere between Africa and Australia. Uh, so yes, and Malaysia is there. So, so this whole space was seen as the land of Eden. Uh, so at some point, Eden and heaven are two, se two separate things. So Eden now is not a heavenly space, but now uh, a, a earthly space, which a earthly space, which is now God, uh, which we cannot find anymore, but we can try to trace uh, the, the elements of it. So, uh, Curtis did a book actually to, to, to give the reasons why he thinks the land of Eden is within this space. One, one of the reasons is because in Australia there is a lot of gold, 
So that is a, the land of Habila. So that is a kind of one of the I call it one of the ways to to somehow figure out where exactly paradise is or where where Eden is. And in 1935, uh, someone developed it further. Uh, and, and this is at a time when I think at the start of the space age or when people are starting looking at the moon and knowing that the probability of me travelling upwards towards the moon is there. So this American James E. Nicholson started to develop a theory that you can find paradise if you find the horizon of the old Mesopotamia. So if you know where exactly you're standing, you look up at the stars, you will see all these uh, layers, and then you will see where the Garden of Eden is. Uh, I, like this. I, I don't understand what you're saying, but I just like the way. Yeah. Uh, so, but then of course, where is this location for you to map out these stars? Which he didn't say. But in 1998, which is quite recent, uh, Chris Ward creates another book, The Map of Eden in the Center of the World, uh, and it somehow shifts pa paradise away from Southeast Asia but more towards the Middle East and North Africa. So, from the map be before, he somehow created a triangle, and within this triangle is where you should stand to, to map out this uh, celestial uh, map to find where paradise is. I think that's quite in, quite interesting because once the concept of where Eden is or where paradise is becomes something of the past, it creates all these new narratives which people can freely uh, you know, like explore to find you know, like where exactly the location is because we know that it doesn't exist anymore. But of course the Hindus solve the problem of where paradise is by so everywhere that uh, Lord Shiva steps on earth is a temple and that is where paradise is. So there's no need to find one location. So like, so this is a miniature from 1823. So basically it shows the temple of the divine and, and the temple of how, of the, of the connection with the divine. But also it shows all the landscape typologies which is within the Mughal Empire at that time. So you have the village, the city, the smaller city, or the river, the mountain, the lake itself. So they are everywhere, so there's no need to think so hard where, where, where this one location is. But of course, going back to uh, this creation of this space, I think this is quite a famous painting from Bruegel. So this again plays with the idea that it is something from the past because as we see there's the pairing of the animals and it shows that it is a post-flood situation, post-great -post flood situation where all the animals are now safe and on, on high land and, you know, and at, at the back you see Adam and Eve plucking the apple again. So Eve is plucking the apple again. So again there's this time time issue where, you know, like this, there's this compression of time, something which was supposed to happen a long time ago and something which happens after that event, but now they're all compressed as one to, uh, to create this, uh, this space again. Uh, yeah. I'm still thinking about this thing too, right? but I find, I'm not sure why I find so much re relevance with this painting of Singapore. Uh, but I find a lot of similarities of this compression of time and uh, looking back. Maybe it's just me, but I, I can't explain. But, uh, again, this uh, compression of time and the yearning for something else. Uh, this, uh, this is a play by Ho Zun Yen, I think a few years ago. Uh, and this is a book about the reshaping of Malaysia and how to do it. Uh, again, the idea of the tiger comes out again in Southeast Asia as a symbol of trying to find something which was gone, or trying to understand something which was gone. Yeah. And 
of, of course, it, it, it goes down to Indonesia as well, this, this symbol of the tiger. Uh, the gesture of creation. Uh, this is something, uh, this was from Marietta Balis. She's a geographer and she spent a lot of time in the Holy Lands in Mount Sinai in Jerusalem to, uh, to do a survey of all these holy spaces. Uh, and she somehow created a kind of a survey for herself of what exactly is these divine spaces. And she actually went back to her place in the U.S. in Long Chorus, and she actually recreated, or not really re recreated, she reinterpreted what she was surveying in the Holy Lands back into a U.S. context. So she actually shaped the land not because she wants to farm or because she wants a nice space within her estate, but because she wants to recreate a paradise based on the survey of, of, the, of, of Jerusalem. There's not much archival uh, materials of this, but she does a lot of uh, sketches of, of, of her estate and, and the changes that, that happen. So, although it looks the same, but her logic is to create that uh, kind of a paradise to be closer to God. That's the gesture for her. And I see this gesture with a friend as well uh, in Yogyakarta where he's currently doing it so I'm trying not to talk too much about it so not to disrupt his work. Uh, but his idea of the landscape is also a way for him to find a paradise on earth and also to lead him back towards the divine. So the way he grows, the way he builds his house, the way he thinks about ecology is all for that one purpose, which is quite an interesting way of uh, looking at how people work with landscape. The third, uh, the, the, the third strategy to create a paradise is by, by evoking ghosts. Uh, so a way is to communicate with the other or to find a way to meet the other world or a way to invoke or to heal a certain tragic past. Uh, in Singapore itself, I think this is quite rare. This is a cemetery, the old uh, Muslim cemetery, which is still there, because uh, I don't know why the the government have not touched it yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> don't say, jinx uh, it, we're jinxing it. Yeah. Okay. So, but then at the back, just before that building, there's the new, or maybe a, a bit more towards the right, there's the new uh, Muslim cemeteries, and these are very logical uh, way of organizing the day where you have a concrete box around you around your grave so it's easier for us or for the future government to stack you up later on so like a lot of at least a lot of my uncles or aunties which passed away the last 20 30 years now they are stacked up together to save space uh, and this is part of the reality of being a Muslim because you will be still be in a HDB flat yeah. even if you will die. But you will with your family. It's a heritage. Maybe I don't like my family, but I'm stuck forever. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, it, uh, Civil Defense at Academy. It's just behind. So it's, it's, not, it's maybe George three or four plots left. George. But, George but uh, again, the idea that such uh, spaces exist also of course it creates the net because if I go into here I can see a Malay ghost but if I go into the most the new Muslim cemetery with all the logic and all the concrete and you know, like everything is stacked so nicely if I see a ghost I will not think no, she's it's scary because yeah, she's just yeah because HD is not good <laughs> yeah. you know like because it's the perception of the grave or the cemetery itself which creates the, the idea of the ghost. So, so I sometimes walk in to somehow find, uh, find back something which I don't know what. But yeah, please visit it before you want. Again, the, a, re, a reincarnation of a, of a scenario 
of a scene, of a biblical scene. So this is uh, a Belgian print from the 1590s, uh, a woodcut, I believe, which shows Jesus and uh, and a scene after the end of the world when everyone is brought up again to have their final judgment. And in the 1610s, it was re recreated by by an uh, Indian painter, by an Indian miniature painter, because of uh, of the when the colonialists came in into India and they, yeah, and they commissioned these painters to to draw it. Uh, and I find it quite interesting because these are um, these are Muslims, and and this is just one page of of a book and the previous page was uh, was part of the Quran so this is quite an interesting uh, contrast to just mix it up because it's just I don't, I don't know how to interpret it so. <laughs> uh, again evoking something so I think this is the Tuapayo Banyan tree before it was struck by lightning or by, by a thunderstorm or something. Mm. <laughs> so now I think it's just a uh, Small stump, lah. But actually, the government actually they actually put some money to uh, to repair the tree, to you know, like to clean it up, to uh, to crop the roots again, and to plant it back in, you know. But uh, but such tree being so significant in such a tight space, that's quite interesting. And also, this is the famous uh, the famous rubber tree at Masjid Kampung Sembawang which I think most Malays will know that this is the tree that stopped the bulldozer from bulldozing the, the, the mosque itself. So this is my grand aunt, and we went to the mosque because you know, like, it's just a nice space because it's quite close to, this, to, the, to Sembawang Beach. But I find it interesting that she actually took a picture of the tree and not the mosque because now the mosque is not significant, or, or the holiness of the mosque, I feel, it's not so significant as much as the holiness of the tree because the myth is that it stopped a bulldozer or a few bulldozers from bulldozing that mosque. So again, this idea of on the line of worshipping a tree and admiring a tree, I think that's quite interesting. Uh, this is maybe not invoking the ghost but trying to bring a dead be a dead person into the ghost world. So I think in Buddhism there's a lot of, especially in Buddhism, in, in Zen Buddhism, and if you are the emperor, then there's a lot of rituals, there's a lot of little little things you need to do before you can enter the gates of the other world. And I find that the idea of to create this temporary space, no matter how small it is, just for you to enter the next world, or for your dead ones to enter the next world, I find that quite uh, amazing uh, gesture of space creation. And also in Zen Buddhism, there's a lot of ways to uh, to be closer to the divine or, or to the spirit world. One way is with the animals by metamorphosis. Uh, so here you have we did an uh, illustration for the, from Buddhist animal scrolls from the 12th century where it shows animals which are either behaving like humans or humans changing into animals and behaving like animals or humans. So it is pl playing around of what is human, of what is the animal and them just behaving in nature uh, to tell stories. Uh, that's interesting. And also again, I think now nowadays I keep seeing this, the tiger and the mouse here, and the kanchil, uh, in a lot of Indonesian uh, works or in Malaysian literature. And I think there's, there's one really nice book called uh, The Tiger Man, The Har Harimau, uh, no, The Lucky Harimau, from an Indonesian writer. And I, and I think it it was translated into uh, into English, and it talks about the, meta the metamorphosis of a man towards the tiger and becoming a man again. 
Uh, and this is the famous rhinos, the famous unicorn that was seen by Antonio Galvano when he first came to Java, which is a rhinoceros. So, uh, so again, I, I find that interesting. If you don't know if it's a rhinoceros, you create the narrative that it is something from your culture. So like the elephant also, when when they first see it, when they first see it, they they link it back to something which is not just an animal or when they see the birds of paradise or certain plants. But I find this really cute. Uh, that the rhinoceros is a unicorn and yeah. And now the rhinoceros is not really you know, like it's endangered so or some species are already extinct. Maybe in twenty sixty two if you see a rhinoceros you will think it's a unicorn. Uh, so this evoking of the ghost again, uh, I really like this. This is maybe a metaphorical view of evoking something from the past. Uh, this is from Abadin Dranath Tago, uh, a painting showing a woman in meditation with tears dropping down on a lotus leaf. Uh, this was, I find this a, a protest painting against the English as well because of the yearning for something which was before, but in a very calm manner. Uh, and also, if you look at recent works from, from Asian directors, film uh, directors, you get a lot of this uh, evoking of, of the other world, or going back towards another world. And I find these three films uh, quite thought-provoking for my uh, paradise research. Uh, this you can find in YouTube. This you know where to find them. I will show one scene from Uncle Boni from Apichatong. Uh, as a... Yeah. Or uh, in, your, in the balcony and, you know, and then suddenly this appearance of, uh, of your dead wife after the initial shock, you know, like it starts to become a normal conversation again of asking about how are you and are you fine and you know like and I find that I find that very close to what maybe I'm trying to find with a tropical landscape. This idea of just sitting there and just you know like there's the forest behind you, there's the crickets and there's also the other world where things are just happening. So for me that feels very much what a tropical landscape or a tropical par paradise can be. Uh, maybe one, one more example. Uh, I think uh, this was one of the first slides I showed when I was presenting it at the Religion and Ecology Department in in Universitas Gajah Mada in Yogyakarta uh, because there was this uh, quite a big discussion about the holy site or the Hajj holy site where it becomes now a very uh, logical or very modernistic uh, com uh, complex uh, and we had this discussion that uh, because of things building around uh, the idea, the mythology of the pilgrimage is gone because uh, again, going back to the idea of the gushing uh, of water, you are you're supposed to enter the holy city when you are crossing it into a desert and you are thirsty and you are like so hot and suddenly you come into a kind of a city where you are secure or you are safe and then in the middle of the city is the symbol of divinity. Uh, and again, this idea of what it's, how the mythology is being created in Islam, but also what it is now. Uh, maybe in the future, I don't know, a lot of people will start to play with this idea of what was gone as a way to recreate a paradise, like what the Christian tradition has done, which I have shown. But also to bring it one step further back into Singapore with all the things ch changing so fast, maybe it's also 
there will be these gestures of trying to find the past, or maybe it's already there, you know, and trying to recreate the past again. Uh, and I think that's it, and I hope you see what you want to see from these images. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Faiz. Uh, I think before we do a Q&A, I just want to maybe open up the discussion and, and also just ask you some of my own questions. And um, so, if we bring it back to, to the origins, not only of your research, but of the word paradise, I suppose, it's interesting to me because um, it comes from a Persian word, if I'm not wrong, and it had actually meant the walled enclosure. So, you know, I like that image that you showed of uh, Mecca because it kind of, uh, both your last slide and the first one you started with, it has this idea of uh, fencing out the outside world and kind of creating a, a garden or some kind of paradise uh, within. And with your own work as a landscape architect, uh, I was interested to, to sort of uh, find out why you started on this line of research because you know you work on things like you were telling me about the uh, Chinese gardens right now and the Esplanade waterfront and you had mentioned that um, in your work you encounter a lot of uh, supposedly European ideas of city and nature um, and, and you were kind of, I don't know, do you, do you find a tension with transplanting that kind of concepts to, to Asia or to the tropics? And is that why you decided to, to go on researching about paradise? I think one of the reasons is that to somehow get out of the European references because in a way the profession of landscape architecture is a, is a European uh, thing, which is not bad or good, it's just it is like that. You know? uh, which I'm okay with, but it's more like I'm trying to bring the next step with tropical landscapes and not just making uh, nice resort kind of uh, spaces because that's what people think, you know, like ferns, banana trees, rain trees, uh, you know, like ferns, more ferns, <laughs> so like, uh, but yeah, ferns are there of course, you know, like, but there's also the tropics itself as a uh, the rainforest itself is not as ideal as we think because it is a very violent uh, space, the, the tropical rainforest. You know, like uh, plants take over each other and they kill each other. You know, like if you see it that, that way, it's not beautiful and, and there's great ants everywhere or hornets and stuff like that. Uh, that is maybe. And also, in landscape architecture, maybe you are trying to create. A human space within a wild nature. That's how I feel what it is. Uh, although, of course, this human space could be very, very, you know, the walls could be very, very rigid, or it could be very, very uh, uh, fluid as well. So, this is something I'm always thinking when does the wall between nature and human cultivation of nature is very thick, and when can it? Because, yeah. When we talk about the concept of uh, paradise and uh, landscapes, if you will, I mean, I was struck when you showed all the examples on the sort of uh, very physical ideas that we have about paradise. I mean, do you think that this is something that is so ingrained in us that whether it is about a search for an earthly paradise or recreation of a lost paradise, can we ever decouple the concepts of a paradise and somewhere physical? Can it, for example, be a mental state? Um, are representations of paradise already moving away from the physicality? You know? I think maybe in, you know, like in, in the concept of Nibbana, or, you know, like it comes more from the mental state. I was actually looking before this at an uh, image of an uh, image of, of a scene showing the one of the last uh, preaching of the Buddha before he he left, and he was sitting under a banyan tree, and all his disciples are around him. But then my practical 
side of the brain was thinking uh, but under the Banyan tree there's so many mosquitoes, there's so many ants, you know, like it's not as <laughs> nice as it looks, <laughs> you know, like if, if you try to sit under a Banyan tree there is enough insects that will try to eat you. No matter how small they are, they will try to bite you and, and try to get a chunk of you. So maybe that is a state of uh, paradise by within your mental state to, to create a paradise but for me I think the physical space is quite important as well because maybe then you can share it with people I think because the mental state is just yourself yeah. and I mean one of my last questions relating it to Singapore and I guess your own practice with uh, altering the landscape here um, do you see those ideas of paradise uh, you know, come to play at things like, I don't know, Gardens by the Bay, or the other day there was just a release of the news of the uh, Tenga uh, Forest City. City yeah. yeah, Forest City, which is a great uh, term, if you ask me. So they are getting rid of um, this uh, is rainforest, a secondary rainforest that is largely used as an army uh, live firing area, and they're building like one of the largest HDB towns here. I mean, and of course with you know like reclamation and things like that. Is there a endless search for paradise here that you see as well? I won't say there's an endless search of paradise from the gestures of the master planners itself. I think, I think it's mainly uh, making you know like for the progress of the city, the logic of finding spaces for people to live for the population. It's, like, it's just rearranging of uh, of space, and of course, a lot of times now people use the word forest or sustainable or biophilia just to sell something. So I think we have to be very critical when some, especially nowadays, when someone says they are green or uh, sustainable, you know? because in a way I I know that when I recreate a park and we say we are keeping biodiversity. Because the gesture of the human hand is still there, you know, like we can't really do it. We can say that maybe in 15 years' time, once the work is done, the biodiversity will expand too much more because we, we plan for it. And that we see a lot, of, especially in the forest in Tokyo, where there is a 100-year plan where, and, and, and it started from scratch. But my worry with Singapore is mainly that uh, the stamina or the, or the patience of letting things develop for maybe a hundred years is not there, I think. We, we, you know, like in, in Singapore, a building which is 20 years is considered old, which is absolutely nonsense. Uh, and a park which is 30 years is, oh, we need to redevelop it for the future. You know? It's a Chinese garden, for example, which I'm working on now. It's around 30 the, years old. The Jurong Lake side garden. So, yeah, so, <laughs> I'm working on the Jurong Lake side garden now. <laughs> So do your research interests of paradise, you know, and, and these uh, concepts come into play actually at your work? Uh, I think the idea of speculating a landscape for a long period of time, I think that's quite important if, you know, if at least we want to talk about landscapes. We cannot talk it in the period of, big, of buildings. We need to talk it a hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years because it has a much longer rhythm than, than an urban space. Because the urban space can, can constantly change. But if, and especially if, yeah, for parks, I feel, if, especially with the old things which I've done, I really hope that uh, the owner of the land will actually keep it for a bit longer than 20 or 30 years before they, they want to redevelop it. So sometimes I put in trees which are growing very, very slowly. So we go like, oh, in 20 years, if we get a really nice, mature, uh, I forgot the English, yeah, the, the, the gulab tree. So we planted a lot of gulab trees in, in Esplanade to bring back the whole uh, shore again. Uh, but it takes like 30 years before you see a nice gulab tree, so hopefully that. Mm. Because, and we put in the rain trees as well, and it takes about 20, 20 years before you actually appreciate the canopy of the rain tree. Uh, 
Yeah, so hopefully it stays for 20 years and maybe people see how oh, it's nice. So these are strategies to somehow stretch the development of space at this point. Paradise itself, no, I think. <laughs> I like paradise as a way to think of things but not to recreate it, I think. Because once you recreate it, then there's the issue of, of the physical space itself. Uh, people will ask, with a question, I like it to be a dream instead to search for. And if you find it already, then that is not paradise anymore. I think. So it's like a Tao concept of if you find Tao, it's not Tao. <laughs> so you keep searching for the next Tao. Okay, on that note, um, do you guys have any questions? You want me to speak up or? Yeah. If you can use the mic, you'll be. Okay for recording. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Unless you don't record. Talk. Um maybe is it possible to see the diagram? Uh, maybe I'll start off with a comment on this. The one with uh, maybe something to do with the uh, uh, next one? Okay, stop it. Yeah. Um the first thing is a comment of it seems like even when you do research, you're still a landscape artist. You create a landscape of your research. Looks like that. Yeah. That's my comment. Uh, my question is... Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. My question is, how, how do you organize your research with this landscape? That's the question. The practice of... How, how do you do your research with, with the help of this landscape? Yes, yeah, right. This, this, so this guides your research, or it helps me to articulate certain things or certain very different uh, elements or different cultures. So in a way, you all of the images you can position them from where is from which perspective is looking at. Because I think where you look at also, you know, it's just a conceptual. Uh, playing with my brain. So if you put an image mm. here, but conceptually you may want to look at it from the resident view or, or stuff like that. So it's more uh, to organize things. So I don't just pick random images, but so this is the question I know. So your questions usually is in a form of a landscape. I mean that's still my diagram. Problem, yeah. 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 I'm not looking for any kind of uh, perfect answer. Thanks. Maybe just to add on very quickly, like because you also do, um, you collect images and you know all these paintings and things like that. But I also notice you when know, you collect sounds, like field recordings, when you're walking yeah, around. You're stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what what is the? I guess it sounds terrible, but the output. Is this leading to a paper, a book, uh, or is this just like a collection of images and ideas? I think the collection of sounds is related to the collection of images of street objects, the spontaneous, the spontaneous street objects and spontaneous street sounds. That one is another thing, I think. It's a, but it's a maybe a, just a way to you know, like things that are attractive to me, like you know, like I walk around, or this is quite interesting, but I don't know where exactly it is yet in this head or in this it's in the context of the street itself. So then I keep it, and there there is a map of that, but there is a difference. You know. But for me, diagrams help to keep a complex idea within a wall space, within a paradise. <laughs> So you're just going to create more and more diagrams and examples? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> diagram of all the diagrams. <laughs> Hi. Uh, uh, I see you in your presentation, you use a lot of narrative. There is a kind of a where I will respond to it from the position of the public and private transcript, where it, where it's theorized that the public transcript, this narrative is actually 
uh, is there to to reinforce the status quo. For example, you talk about the, the Iran emperor, we do that. And then if you if we jump from that to uh, Singapore where they consider 20, 30 years old thing uh, as old and then they need to reconstruct it. So this kind of public transcript that go out is actually reinforcing a kind of power structure and all that. Are there also a, a private transcript which actually is a kind of resistance where the people create their own narrative where as a counter, for example, to the public one being, uh, being present at the top, is there a private transcript on, on paradise used as a countermeasure because then they are not satisfied with the dominant interpretation of paradise. They create their, they create their own paradise as a counter, as a form of resistance, as a form of critique. Is there a possibility of a such thing? I think it is there. It is the farms of Marietta Palis and Iskada Wawarunto. So in a way, they are creating narratives for themselves within a... So for Marietta Palis, I, how I read her is that she's creating the narrative of what was paradise from the church uh, because she found her spirituality when she was going through the to the Holy Lands, but it feels that she's not happy with it in, at some point, or maybe she can't get the context of it in her in her own uh, homeland. So I, I find that this is maybe not a resistance, but a sub-narrative from the bigger paradise narrative of the church. Uh, but also with Iskandar, uh, I talk to him quite a lot, and he, uh, in the back of his mind, it is a resistance to to, to capitalism, uh, to the uh, and to more the, and also the resistance to uh, to the idea of Islam as a, as a Middle Eastern uh, religion in Southeast Asia, the, the, the Islamization of Southeast Asian Islam. So he's trying to create a new way of looking at religion which is more based for the tropics. So he's in a way maybe a Middle Eastern uh, mm. uh, preacher may say that he's not really a Muslim because he's mixing <laughs> Javanese ideas or Buddhist ideas. But, uh, I find that his gestures is, is very strong and, and I feel this was what was before when I was a kid, this this was what Islam was before in Southeast Asia, because we are very flexible with our with, uh, with our culture. We, yeah, because I remember when I was a kid, we mixed a lot of Hinduism and uh, and, and and Islam, uh, Islamic ideas together. So, yeah. so may I follow up with another question? Uh, does he work very alone? or his friend, or does he uh, also take activities into the public where he can seek uh, affirmation or validation from his uh, fellow uh, resident around there or, or outside the village or town? Does he uh, uh, actively seek kind, such kind of affirmation? I think maybe only in the last three, four years that he started to actually kind of a way of preach his way of looking at uh, things because in a way he, he farms his own uh, things and the, his gesture of farming he, he will always say is to to get closer to God and because the end world is coming so it's a very pessimistic uh, is he an imam? no, no, no it's not an imam, it's just a normal he can preach, he's allowed no, 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 he, he preaches in a way uh, or like he talks about what, what he's person. doing. Yeah, yeah. He's a day person. So uh, he started to he he started in in Bali actually where he created his own world, but he went to Yogyakarta because he feels Yogyakarta is more Indonesian than Bali. Yeah. Or like he gets closer to real in Indonesian powers. So he, he preached the idea that you don't need to uh, 
you don't need to grow rice for the factories or for the, for the companies. You can you can be more profitable by just growing your own food and whatever surplus you have, you sell it. You can be much more uh, richer. That's what he's trying. To. So he's mixing the religion, the socialist movement, the idea of farming for yourself and and farming as a gesture to reach another level of holiness so, as a kind of resistance. Any other comments or questions, reactions? Does it make sense? <laughs> no? Both? Um, thanks for sharing, guys. Um, can we go back to the slide about the, I think, mar ma Macaramis or something? It was like some tessellated design. I was just like curious if it was uh, a painting or a shot of a building. Uh, yeah, this one. A shot of the ceiling. Okay. One of, of, of the dome. Okay. So the idea is to create a complexity of layered patterns. So when you when you look up, you will uh, see there is no end towards this mosaic. That's this. And you, and yeah, this is. And if you go to the uh, in Istanbul, the uh, what the blue mosque, the Hagia Sophia, mm. that there's also this trick of reaching the divine by having three layers of domes. So you enter one, or you see, oh, that's a very big dome. Then you walk through it, you see how oh, there's, there's another big dome there, and that must be the biggest dome. Then you pass through the third layer, you see how oh, there's another super big dome, and there is no pillars, and that is where the emperor sits. And he's layering, or in a way, it's there. Yeah. That also is interesting as a designer. Mm -hmm. how Did you get to see this? No, not yet. Okay. Where exactly is it? Is in Alhambra in Spain. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Faiz. Uh, I, I was looking at your talk, do you see a lot of diversity? Uh, you have Middle East, Japanese, Zen, Buddhist, Chinese Mormons. So, how do you decide three strategies? But how do you decide what kind of sophisticated examples that you're going to put in? Like, what sort of selection criteria or curatorship or something like that that you use? Uh, as long as I like it, I put it in. <laughs> <laughs> because it, yeah, it's a, in a way, all, all these things are very personal eh? and the logic is also very personal. So that's why I, I sometimes ask you get something from it as well or you see something else which I don't see you know, from, 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 from the diagram so the curatorship is I like it and I put it okay I accept that thanks in fact you presented this talk in uh, Jakarta before and somewhere else in Singapore right? at the ETH Future Cities what was the reaction like especially in Jakarta the talk was created for for the for, for the university in Georgia, so it's it's a depart, it's a small department. I don't know what, what is the bigger department, but it's a small department studying ecology and religion as something linked together. I find that quite interesting because once you mix these two together, then you get a you know you get a physical space and you get this metaphorical space. Your body as the forest. Things like that. And the idea of ecology as part of the spiritual world. So that was why it came about the physicality of how paradise may look like in different cultures. And the reaction is quite interesting because they are all scholars of a certain particular topic between religion and ecology. And this, I find that they see something within their, their research. With FCL, it's uh, mainly architects, so I tweak it a bit also the presentation, and and I think they somehow see it as a, as a spatial design. So for me, because now we have a very mixed group, so I'm quite 
interested what you see from this. I wonder if I can also ask you about um, the film you showed us an extract from Kobu Me. Because you know you said that that was kind of um, I don't know whether it symbolized or it pointed towards your own personal take on what paradise could be, especially in the tropics. And it's very interesting to me because if you look at the background, it's pretty much wild jungle and from which later the, the sort of monster or this like uh, old B grade movie creature comes out of it. And I'm wondering if the idea of paradise can be linked to conservation in terms of not recreating or uh, finding a certain place, but really just preserving nature as is. In a way, if you look at all the gardens and the Persian gardens, the idea of paradise in Christianity it is a preservation of, of this and of the landscape space in its ideal form because nothing really close. There's no weed, there's no uh, insects, you know, if you look at the paintings uh, from, from previously. So if you see, if you, you, so my answer maybe is you can link conservation and paradise uh, as, a, you know, like as a way to keep this in, in its ideal state, but I will also question that gesture. Because then you are putting so much effort trying to keep something at a state which, in a way, what you want it to be. So I, I won't call it con conservation because then it's the same gesture as building a new thing for me. That kill me. <laughs> Do you have any other questions or reactions? Anything you want to add on also? Fights? Well, I think I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, oh. basically, I want to say thank you because this topic, I think that never passed in my mind. And after this presentation, I started to think about this. And that's wonderful. Thank you. Maybe I ask you a question. <laughs> what do you see? Because, oh, I don't know. I mean, I, no, no. Okay. I, I, basically, it's this. Uh, Okay, this topic about paradise, eating, all of that, it's okay, it's something that, as you said, maybe if you find it, it's not, no? it's something else, no? and that relation between something that maybe it's in your mind, or maybe it's a landscape that could be, that combination, I never thought on that, no? it's, it's more about the general cons concept of, the, of this topic. Thank you. If you do have any other comments or questions, um, Faiz also has an artwork outside. Uh, I think it's totally unrelated, right? It's unrelated. You want to share a bit more about it? So do not think it's <laughs> It's on the spontaneous uh, uh, caster books. Tell us so about it, yeah. Yeah, uh, so it's a mapping of uh, the hooks casted by the Sungai Road vendors. So if you go to Sungai Road and your vendors have set up their tents, you will not really see it because they have used the hooks uh, to pitch their tents. Uh, but if you are there in the early mornings or the late evenings, you will see these hooks casted to the asphalt road and, and they did it as a gesture for themselves to solve a problem. And that is also one of the mappings I like, this spontaneous uh, solving of a problem on the pub in, in public space for your own needs. So, so that is the artwork, is a mapping of these hooks, of, of, of all the hooks that the uncles have in Sumaira. When I saw it on the first day, I was so confused by it. I mean, I highly recommend it, but it's so bizarre. I was like, this has got to be fiction, but it's totally true. And also, um, in the gallery right now, uh, Clara Chow, the artist and former arts critic, I think, She's uh, doing a project called DreamWorks, so you can fill out this little form here. The first question is, you are an artist, you can make any work you want, what would it be? So please feel free to fill it in. I think there's a chalk and there's some kind of archival thing to it. So yeah, and there's so many works around. And we have now talked at five, right? The whole output reading? Yeah. Oh, it's a reading? It's, it's a collective reading. Uh, is that 5 p.m. here? Yes. Yep. 5 p.m. Okay. 5 
So uh, thank you so much for coming. Please look around and uh, buy stuff from the shop too. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you.